Hello and welcome to the ZSL Wild Science Podcast. I'm Ellie Darby, the Science Communications and Events Manager here at the Zoological Society of London's Institute of Zoology. In this episode, I'm going to be revealing the amazing unseen, or rather unheard, world of wildlife pathology. I will be joined by ZSL's experienced pathologists and scientists to discuss how they use pathological techniques to peer into this unseen internal world where the immune system fights wars of attrition against hordes of invading bacteria, where viruses hide within the body's own cells and environmental pollutants corrupt vital chemical reactions. We'll hear about the practicalities of performing post-mortems on zoo animals, from enormous elephants to tiny invertebrates, before shifting to discoveries of diseases and pollutants affecting wildlife and investigations of cetacean strandings on British coasts. Now, the world of pathology, and wildlife pathology in particular, is possibly quite unknown to most of you, but hopefully with the help of our four pathology professionals, we will show the value of the diagnostic and scientific work that they do for the conservation of animals, both in live collections and in the wild. The first guest guiding me through the fascinating and complicated world of pathology is Dr. Simon Spiro, a wildlife veterinary pathologist working in the Wildlife Health Services here at ZSL. Simon has degrees in veterinary medicine and pathology and a PhD in virology. Previously, he's worked on developing vaccines for poultry diseases at the Purbright Institute before undertaking a residency in veterinary anatomic pathology at the Royal Veterinary College. Clearly, you have a wealth of knowledge and experience. But before we start, let's go right back to the basics. What is pathology? Well, pathology is the science of disease. And pathology in a medical context is the art, I suppose, of diagnosing diseases. I'm a particular kind of pathologist, the anatomic pathologist, which means that I diagnose diseases based on the changes that those diseases make to our cells and to our tissues. So it's a bit weird to think about, but if you have a cough, if you have a runny nose, that that is because the tissues in your body have been damaged and this leaves visible changes or lesions. And it's my job to simply look at those lesions with my eyes or with a microscope and try and work out what's going on. How did you get into this line of work? Did you always know that that's what you wanted to do? So I've always loved the science of disease. I've loved infectious diseases. I was fascinated by viruses and parasites from a very young age. Uh, So when I finished my uh, degrees and went to do a PhD, it was always going to be in in infectious diseases. And I ended up working in the field of virology. And viruses, as we've all learned recently, are very, very small to the point where you can't see them even with a microscope. So I spent a lot of time working with colourless liquids, you know, hoping that there was actual virus inside there. And I got a bit disheartened by uh, this sort of work and decided I wanted to go back to things I could see. So pathology was a great way to continue working with disease, but on a much more tangible level. So where does your work come into wildlife conservation? Well, ultimately, when we try to conserve animals, when we try to maintain populations, what we're trying to do is stop them from dying. And if you want to stop them from dying, you need to understand how they're dying in the first place. So pathology can tell us what diseases are affecting these animals, whether they have infectious diseases or whether it's a nutritional problem or an environmental problem. There's also forensic pathology where we can see whether they're being killed by other animals or even by humans. You can't really conserve anything until you understand what it is you're trying to fight. And pathology is key in doing that. So what's the process you take in a pathological examination? The vast majority of the time I'm presented with a dead animal. And my first port of call is the post-mortem examination. This is a very thorough dismantling of the carcass, a dissection in which I try and examine every organ and every tissue, um, separate them out, look at their interactions with each other and search for these lesions. So sometimes the lesions are very big and very obvious. So just the other day, I was doing a post-mortem on a wallaby and it had a very large tumour of its ovary, so a good 30 centimetres across. But just because I can see there's a tumour doesn't mean I know exactly what type of tumour it is or what caused it or how significant it might be. So during the post-mortem, I will take various samples And the most common sample I'll take is tissues for histopathology, 
Histopathology is when you make, you turn a tissue into a slide. So you take an ultra thin section of it and are able to look down at the individual cells that make up that tissue to see what's going wrong. Sometimes there are no gross changes, uh, so no macroscopically visible changes. And the only changes I'll find will be at that microscopic stage. I might find, you know, small parasites living inside the organs or even changes on a cellular level, you know, accumulations of proteins or uh, necrosis of tissues, things like that. And on the macroscopic scale, is that called a gross postmortem or gross pathology? So that's called gross pathology. Gross pathology is being able to recognise lesions that are visible with the naked eye. I mean, it's quite the phrase as well. You must be pretty used to seeing and smelling or touching some unusual and probably quite gross things in your work. Are you completely immune to that now? Or can you think of something that took some getting used to? I'm pretty immune to all of the standard anatomy. So it doesn't really bother me. So for example, if I do a postmortem on an elephant, a five ton elephant will have about 350 litres of blood in its body. So it's pretty inevitable with such a large animal that there will be blood everywhere. And that really doesn't bother me at all anymore. Where I get less happy is when the carcasses, maybe a few days before they come to me, when you start getting maggots and they start rotting and smelling, that can get a lot less pleasant. Something I tend to do is uh, is, uh, buying vapor rub, the the cold medicine, and rubbing a large amount of that under my nose. Wow. Yeah, I think I would definitely need a bucket of that. (laughs) It's not fun. How difficult is that physically doing postmortems on on large animals like that? And how do you get through the skin? It's a really good point. It does get incredibly difficult. Elephants have very thick skin, but if you have a sharp knife, you can cut through it relatively straightforwardly. Mm. The problems I found in terms of skin are actually fish because fish have bony scales. Uh, And so if you do very large fish, the biggest fish I've done was about 40 kilos. Because that's got these bony scales, then there's no way you can get through that with a knife. So I to get into that, I had to use a pair of pliers to sort of pluck out each scale individually and then bolt cutters to cut through the skin. But going back to elephants, the problem is in just the sheer difficulty of moving around the organs and tissues. Most quadrupeds, we do them lying on their side, then the legs are overlying the carcass. So the first thing you have to do is remove the legs. An animal that's a few hundred kilos, like a horse or a a moose or something large like that, I can usually lever the legs off okay. But when you're getting to elephant sizes, you need a forklift truck and a lot of ropes and a a team just to lift legs. Those legs weigh several times my own weight. There's no way I can pick them up. It's a huge logistical task. So if anyone is interested in finding out more about what a postmortem involves, you can check out our event, Revealing the Unseen, on our ZSL Science and Conservation YouTube channel, which shows Simon and his team carrying out a postmortem on an African lion from Whipsnade Zoo in April 2020. I will share a link to this in our show notes, but fair warning, this is a very thorough process in which an animal is carefully dismantled and examined. So please only go looking for this if you don't mind graphic images. So we've talked about the larger animals. What about really tiny animals? You must need to know about so many different anatomies and physiologies. How, how do you handle this? Yeah, that's certainly the hardest part of my job is just the sheer variety of what I have to examine. I trained primarily on mammals with a little bit of birds. Uh, and now I find myself doing fish, reptiles, invertebrates. And the inverts are the weirdest by far. They've got, there's so much variety in the invertebrate kingdoms. You know, the difference between a starfish and an ant is far greater than the difference between a human and a fish. So it's complicated. The smallest things I have to examine are things like tiny corals, uh, which are colony organisms. So there I'd, I'd probably, I'd examine several thousand coral polyps on a single slide. There's no gross pathology for corals. It's all microscopic. The smallest individual animal I've done would probably be something like a male black widow spider, which are about 0.1 grams. I put it under a dissecting microscope, which is basically a very big magnifying glass. And that lets me examine the animal to look for any wounds or any obvious external problems. And then it's the whole thing going onto a slide for histopathology. Something I've got really into recently is uh, ZSL has a very large collection of critically endangered freshwater fish. Uh, and these fish are only a you know, maximum of about four or five centimetres long, and they're very difficult to examine grossly. But that size does mean they do fit very nicely on a microscope slide. So I have been moving to this idea of sort of PM on a slide, where instead of taking samples of tissues, I can actually look at an entire fish 
from head to tail uh, on a slide. That, that's been absolutely fascinating and has really opened up fish pathology to me. So as I've mentioned, you work within ZSL, which of course encompasses London and Whipsnade zoos. Do you carry out post-mortems on every animal that dies in our zoos? Yes, pretty much every animal. I will admit there are there are some exceptions. For example, we have a very large ant colony, um, leaf cutter ants in our bugs exhibit. I can't say I've examined every single ant that's died. Every year or so, I will get a handful of ants, as it were, to just double check and make sure things are looking okay. Check that they've got adequate levels of fat, that they look healthy. This sort of surveillance, I think, is important. It's, it's easy to forget the smaller animals and think that they're less significant than our larger ones. But, you know, we, we have a duty to them as well, and I want to know that they're healthy and disease-free. Of course. So can you talk us through a short example where a post-mortem investigation has impacted our zoo animals? So one of the animals we keep at London Zoo is a critically endangered bird called the Montserrat Oreo which are beautiful little things. They come from Montserrat. So Jersey Zoo, a couple of decades ago, uh, took some animals from the wild and established a breeding colony in Jersey, several of which have since come to London Zoo. And we're maintaining them here in the hope of eventually re-releasing them into the wild when it's safe to do so. And we had an elderly Montserrat Oriole die last year. Uh, Nothing particularly wrong with it. It was just a sort of old age but I believe in doing these thorough investigations. And inside its brain, I noticed some funny lesions called Laphora bodies. And it's quite normal to find one or two Laphora bodies in a very old animal, but this one had probably several hundred, which is really unusual. There is a disease called Laphora disease, where you get thousands of these bodies in the brain of very young animals, and that's quite quickly fatal. But it's weird to find large numbers in an apparently healthy animal. So Laphora disease is, is a genetic disease. It's caused when you have two uh, mutations in both copies of the Laphorin or Marlin genes. So I started wondering that maybe this bird just had a single mutation in one of those genes, not enough to give it the full disease, but enough to give it a lot more Laphora than we'd normally expect. That in itself isn't a problem for the individual bird, but bear in mind this is in a captive breeding program, which means there's necessarily quite a small gene pool. And I started thinking if if this gene is becoming uh, prevalent in the population, then it could be that we start getting young Orioles being born with both copies of the gene and dying shortly afterwards. It may be that this has also already happened, and this might explain some of the problems we've had breeding the species. So I've been able to get a grant to investigate this possibility, and we've been making uh, travelling to Jersey and to London and retrieving as many brains as we can from Montserrat Orioles that have died over the last 20 years. Uh, We've already found at least one more case suggesting this wasn't an isolated individual. uh, And we're busy developing a blood test to see if we can identify the gene involved. And if so, we can test live animals and make sure we don't breed any two animals that both have the mutation. And that way we can hope to uh, eradicate this disease before we release them back into the wild. That's incredible. So a real practical application of pathology and histopathology. Absolutely. Now, I've heard you compare your work to the Supreme Court of Diagnostics. Can you please explain this phrase? Yes. So my wife's a lawyer. So a lot of our discussions at home is the intersection of law and pathology. And I I like to compare myself to the Supreme Court. If you think of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom or the United States, they get the hardest cases. They get the cases once everyone else has weighed in. They get the final say. And they usually give their findings several years after the event and when may not be as directly relevant to that case, but will massively influence future cases. And I think it's the same with pathology we don't get well in the zoo we get every case but in generally in real life pathologists only see a small handful of the hardest cases that vets haven't been able to diagnose while the animal was alive we get those hard cases we get a definitive diagnosis and especially in the zoo context the findings that we make are going to have a massive impact on the remaining animals and they're going to change how we do things in future and particularly for our vet team they're going to change how they approach diseases in those animals because they'll have an idea of what they're looking for next time and you both wear great outfits we both wear gowns thank you so much for joining me simon it's been a fascinating insight into the practicalities and the mysteries of wildlife pathology thank you very much 
Next up on this episode, I have Dr. Becky Lawson here. Becky is a Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Zoology at ZSL and has been based here for almost 20 years. After qualifying as a vet, she began working with the treatment and rehabilitation of British wildlife casualties and subsequently focused on disease surveillance and outbreak investigation of various conditions affecting terrestrial and marine wildlife species. So Becky, what is your main research focus at ZSL currently? So I'm a a wildlife vet at ZSL and uh, my research focuses on investigating the disease conditions that affect free living wildlife in Great Britain. And typically, um, or certainly in recent years, I've focused primarily on garden birds, but also on amphibians and hedgehogs and reptiles. And uh, the aim is to understand these disease conditions and the threats that they may pose to wild animal welfare but also to biodiversity and conservation, and at the same time, any implications that they might have for public health or for the health of livestock or our pet animals. So it's a very holistic uh, research approach. Brilliant. And a lot of these threats that you're talking about will be pathogens, I'm assuming. What is the definition of a pathogen and what types are there? Yes, uh, so certainly not all, but many of the diseases that we talk about are infectious diseases. Pathology is the study of disease pathogens are agents which can cause disease. We tend to group those in five categories and they would fall under bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi and prions. So what are some of the most well-known pathogenic threats to wildlife? So I think there are two fungal diseases that spring to mind that are very important as threats to biodiversity. The first would be amphibian chytridiomycosis. There are two chytrid fungi here I'm referring to, Botryca chytridium dendrobatidis, or BD for short. What a Um, mouthful. (laughs) Exactly. So BD, over the past two or three decades is unfortunately recognised as uh, a cause of amphibian declines, even extinctions across many different areas of the world. Another fungal pathogen uh, would be the cause of whiteness syndrome, uh, and that's Pseudogymnascus destructans. That has led to the deaths of millions of insectivorous bats in North America. And in both of those conditions, we think that those are introduced pathogens. And why is wildlife disease surveillance important or necessary even? The wildlife disease surveillance is information collection for action. We need long-term monitoring in place for our wildlife species to be able to understand what we would call the endemic or the established or the normal conditions and what they mean in terms of wildlife health and public health and livestock health. And with that background knowledge, we're then in a position to, we hope, rapidly identify new and emerging threats And then think about if it's appropriate, should we be taking any mitigation action? Can we do anything to help prevent or control those problems when they do occur? So that sounds like it would need a great amount of collaboration to gather that big database of background information before you can even start collecting new information. Yeah, the veterinary investigation part is is a is a real sort of piece of the jigsaw, and we work with scientists from all around the world in different countries, different disciplines, people with expertise, ornithologists, herpetologists, uh, or different analytical skills. So um, it's a really collaborative effort. That's amazing. So you're part of the Garden Wildlife Health Project at ZSL. Obviously, that's also a collaboration with with some other organisations. Can you tell me a bit more about this? how it came about and which wildlife species you focus on? Yes, so you're absolutely right. We work in partnership uh, with the British Trust for Ornithology, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds and Fog Life. The work began really from the early 1990s with members of the public who had observed common frogs in their garden ponds being ill. They'd observed garden birds around their feeding stations being ill and they'd wanted to understand uh, what the causes of those problems were. So we've had involvement with some of these species for several decades, but in 2013, that's when we launched Garden Wildlife Health with our website for reporting. And uh, we added in hedgehogs as a species, um, unfortunately, as we all know, in decline. Uh, We wanted to look at whether disease or health conditions might be playing a role. And we added in terrestrial reptiles for the first uh, time because they're a group for which we know very little about their health status. 
and it's a citizen science project. We rely on members of the public who very kindly spare their time and report sightings of sick or dead garden wildlife to us via gardenwildlifehealth.org. And that's a national scheme across Great Britain that aims to learn about the health conditions that affect those species groups. So you receive a report of a sick or dead animal. And once you receive the specimen itself, if that applies, what happens then? So in our laboratories at Regent's Park, we start with systematic post-mortem examination. And, and that the first step is a visual inspection. But then we, depending on our findings, we do all sorts of additional laboratory tests. So we might in particular look for parasites or we might take samples where we try and grow bacteria or fungi. And that would be called microbiology. Or we might fix um, samples and look at them under the microscope. And that would be called histology, or we can use a molecular diagnostic tests to um, see if the DNA of some pathogens are present. We might do specialist toxicological work, and then we bring all of that information together, and we try and ascertain a, a diagnosis of a cause of death, but we also look to see if there are underlying conditions that we think are important. And whenever we examine a wild animal, we take time to collect an archive of tissues. We've got tens of thousands of samples on site. At ZSL. It's a, a unique national resource that means that we are really well placed to do additional studies. And all those procedures that you were talking about when you receive a specimen, that sounds like a huge range of skills and expertise. Are you working with several people doing that or is, could you be the person doing all of those different steps? Absolutely. <laughs> It's again, it's a real turn out. So we are, we are very fortunate. We've got two very experienced microbiologists on staff at ZSL who are excellent. But some specialist work is also performed externally. And we have um, a boarded uh, pathologist on site who conducts some of the histology. So it very much depends. And the tests that we conduct depend on the species and our findings. Certainly uh, many different disciplines and sets of experiences required. But I bet you must learn a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and not only through working with all of the people who are involved in the kind of different diagnostic disciplines, but I get a huge amount, learn enormous amount by working with ornithologists, or the, the people who really know about the natural history of the species and the ways that those species move or migrate or their population trends. So on this episode, we're talking all about how pathology can be used as a tool to understand wildlife health. Can you talk me through an example of this in your work with the Garden Wildlife Health Project? Sure. A good example would be how we went about um, demonstrating that snake fungal disease or uh, aphidiomycosis, as we now call it, affects wild snakes in, in Europe. Uh, we only began working, uh, looking into the health conditions of wild reptiles in 2013. But as you can imagine, there's, there's very little known about them. They're difficult to study. Uh, so we began conducting post-mortems on grass snakes. And through that work, we noticed a small number of animals with skin lesions. That's a, a feature of snake fungal disease. So we're aware from uh, conferences, from scientific literature, that this condition is an emerging one in North America in wild snakes. And so we wanted to establish whether or not we might be seeing something similar. So uh, it was a detective process taking tissues under the microscope and looking for evidence of fungi using special stains, looking for the morphology, the shape of them, and seeing if that fit with the, the profile of Phidiomyces, which causes this disease. We also tried to grow fungi in uh, the lab. And then we reached out to the team of scientists at the National Wildlife Health Centre in uh, Wisconsin, who've led a lot of the research in this condition. And they very kindly collaborated. They uh, ran a molecular test to try and characterise the fungi that we identified. And triangulating all of these results, comparing our experiences, um, we together were able to diagnose uh, this condition for the first time in wild snakes in Europe. We were also able to show that the strains and the genetics of those strains for North America and Europe are, are distinct. And there are many questions still to ask. So um, we don't know if our other two native snakes, the adder and the smooth snake, are susceptible 
the ophidiomycosis. So we continue to conduct our surveillance. And um, then we've taken it a step further. There is a uh, a PhD student who uh, we're collaborating with who's dedicating uh, their studies to grass snakes and as part of that they're looking for evidence of uh, snake fungal disease trying to get an idea as to how frequently it might occur how severe it is and, and the importance that it might have to grass snake health. That's an example of how we started with the post-mortem we've worked with all sorts of different herpetological organizations in the UK collaborated with North America and now the work's gone from the lab and extended into the field but all really underpinned by using pathology as a tool. That's brilliant and a a wonderful example of using that network around the world and also using that archive of samples. That's absolutely right we went through all of our archive and we're also very uh, fortunate to have collaboration with an organisation who'd got an archive of sloughed skin sheds so you can still see the lesions on sloughed skin? You can get an impression of a change in the, the colour and the thickness. If you then take a sample of that and extract the DNA and run the molecular test, you can see if that very specific sort of fungi was present. So what are some of the biggest achievements of the Garden Wildlife Health Project as a whole? What are you most proud of? Most proud of would be demonstrating and capitalising on the interest uh, and the concern that members of the public have for wild animal welfare and conservation and building the network of organisations that meet regularly to discuss the findings. In terms of importance, I think I have to say the work that we've done charting the emergence and unfortunately the the very severe impact of finch trichomonosis. So that's a parasitic disease that we first saw about 15 years ago and it's caused epidemic mortality affecting quite a wide range of small garden birds but in particular the green finch. As a consequence of that we're constantly looking at ways that we can try and help and that uh, parasite might spread when birds congregate at feeding stations, it's spread in, in fresh saliva. So uh, last year, we published best practice guidance on feeding garden birds, which includes information on how to try and prevent problems occurring and the actions to take if people do observe what they think may be a disease outbreak. And where can people find that best practice information or how can they you know, learn more about Garden Wildlife Health Project? So we've got lots of information on the website, which is www www.gardenwildlifehealth.org. There's a library of fact sheets on common conditions we observe or important things we're looking out for also. There's sections of best practice guidance on feeding birds, but also on uh, people who have pet amphibians, biosecurity guidance on how we can work to try and avoid accidentally releasing diseases to the wild So I would encourage people to take a look at the website and see if there's any information that's that's useful for them there. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Becky. And it's been amazing to learn more about the Garden Wildlife Health Project and its impacts on British wildlife. Thank you. Nice to speak with you. Now I'm joined by Rob Deville a cytologist who also works here in ZSL's Institute of Zoology. Rob is the project manager of the UK Cetacean Strandings Investigation Programme, or CSIP for short, and he has over 20 years of experience in strandings response, recovery and investigation, both in the UK and internationally. So first, let me just check. I said in my introduction that you're a cytologist by trade. That's whales, dolphins and porpoises, is that right? Spot on. Yeah, somebody who studies cetaceans. And can you tell me a bit about the Cetacean Strandings Investigations Programme? Or I'm just going to refer to it as CSIP from now on. So it's been going since 1990, so we've been running for over 30 years now. And it was set up by UK government to investigate strandings of marine animals, mainly cetaceans, around the UK coast, to try and learn more about why they were stranding and whether the cause of the stranding had an anthropogenic driver or were more naturally occurring. And for those that have a man-made driver, what can we do to try and mitigate their impact in the future? And have you been working on it since then, since its inception? It feels like it some days. No, uh, I've been involved in the programme since 1998. So what is that? 20 years, 23 years. So talk me through a stranding. What happens when you get the call? 
So strandings can be reported to us from all sorts of sources. And I guess the first thing is, you know, what is it? Where is it? Can we safely access it? That's a lot easier now. Everyone has a camera phone. Back in the day, we had to wait for people to send photos through in a post. And that's a little bit problematic. So once you get that camera phone picture pretty quickly, you can then say, OK, we're interested in it. It looks to be fresh enough because animals turn up in all kinds of conditions, should we say. And then if it's fresh enough, if it's safe to access and if we're available, then we'll try and recover it back to one of our three or four facilities in the UK where we can carry out a post-mortem and try and learn more about why it's died. So it's not just your team at ZSL, there's there's others dotted around the UK as well. Yeah, it's very much not the Rob show uh, or the ZSL show. There's, <laughs> it's a constructed programme. There are five or six different primary partners around the UK, but then we've, we've got involvement with a load of different um, statutory and voluntary in, uh, institutions that all have some involvement or buy-in in terms of stranding response. So we, we work really closely with groups like British Divers, Marine Life Rescue, RSPCA, with JNCC, lots of different groups out there or all, all help us in our aims to try and learn more about why the these things, these events happen. And why do they happen? What are the main threats facing cetacean species? Why do you think that these strandings happen? Lots of different reasons. In terms of the threats that we see around the UK coast, being accidentally caught in fishing gear or bycatch is definitely the main or primary direct man-made driver of mortality. We also record cases of ship strike. Uh, we also see impacts of pollution. And when I say pollution, I'm splitting into three different categories. Chemical, where we have chemical pollutants concentrated up to the food chain, causing impacts in various cetaceans. Physical, so animals can accidentally ingest plastic or become entangled in marine debris at sea. And then acoustic, because a lot of these animals live in, in an acoustic environment, their primary sense is acoustic. So noise, things that we do in the marine environment can also impact on them as well. Roughly how often do these call-outs happen for you, the, um, these stranding calls? Is that weekly, monthly? Are there times of year where there's more for any reason? Daily. So Daily. Uh, we flesh it out and put some numbers on it. I mean, every year at the moment, we're getting around a thousand reports or a, a stranding events um, around the UK coast, which sounds like a lot. And it is a lot, but we're an island. We have lots of wiggly bits of coastline, lots of room for cetaceans to strand. I think it's also a value to point out that we've had 22 species recorded stranded around the UK coast over that 30 year period. And that's about a quarter of the world's known cetacean species because we're still discovering new species as well. And that's really cool. But that reflects the UK is quite a unique position. We've got very diverse habitats around uh, in the UK waters. Shallow coastal waters, we get things like porpoises. Deeper waters, where we get pelagic species like common dolphins, baling whales, and then very deep continental shelf edge, where we get the deep divers, things like beaked whales and sperm whales. All those species are found around the UK. And what's the most unusual species that you've seen or investigated in this work? They are all interesting and beautiful in their own different way. Of course. But, I mean, uh, there, are, there are some spectacularly unusual animals that strand. And I guess not just cetaceans, because we also work on seals, marine turtles and shark species too. And because I, I, we don't see them that often, I think turtles and sharks are really, really cool. Because I mean, they're just, they're just amazing looking animals. They look, uh, they are obviously ancient forms. Prehistoric. And, uh, hundreds of millions of years. So when you see one of those and you get to look inside them, I'm just blown away by how adapted they are to marine environment and what they look like. You asked me to pick out cetacean i'm going to pick out the pygmy sperm whale just because it looks weird if people haven't seen a pygmy sperm whale out there go out and google it it looks like a shark because it's got this low underslung jaw with very pointy teeth sticking out and then the really cool thing about it is it has a, a sack at the rectal end that it can poop out red poo to confuse its prey so it's acting like an ink from a squid so they're wow. just the weirdest weirdest animals when you get to examine them up close up that, above. that is cool so today's episode we're talking all about wildlife pathology Obviously, that comes into your work quite a lot. You're carrying out post-mortems on these animals once they've been stranded or often always moved to the PM room. But I suppose sometimes you must need to do it on site as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, like, most of the species that we deal with are fairly small. So porpoises, delphinids, we can recover those back to lab fairly easily. But when you get a large animal on the beach or lots of animals together, when you get a mass stranding event, you have to go on site where you can't recover a 30-ton whale back to Regent's Park. And equally, it's just pragmatically, it's more, it's easier for you to be on site and do what you can there but that presents a whole host of other problems as well. I spoke with Simon earlier in this podcast and he was talking about some of the logistics of carrying out post-mortems on elephants and rhinos and but I mean some of these whales and things like that must be twice the size and how do you deal with that logistically kind of access to them to the site and also you know do you have to get large vehicles involved or? or... Uh, bigger knives um, yeah very much That's so. what Simon <laughs> said. <laughs> there you go it's a common theme of pathology but the main issue to be honest is um, with the larger animals uh, is access 
is trying to get permissions to do that work. I spend most of my time when I'm doing the whales just dealing with people because you're negotiating all the time about what you can and can't do. We don't have any legal right of access. And so you're dependent upon the landowner and their goodwill to allow you to try and examine the animal on site. And again, drawing a veil perhaps slightly over the process because it can be quite graphic. You're obviously making a mess and there's a disposal issue. And to be serious for a second, you know, a 30 ton whale um, is a big headache for somebody who has to stump up the the money to get rid of it. So that responsibility uh, falls on the landowner. Yeah. There's a really weird term in the UK called royal fish, which dates back to a statute enacted by Edward II in 13 something or other. That's the first bit of statute over cetacean. So that was wow. food. So his soldiers would turn up and then chop the dolphin in half and he would have the head and the queen would have the tail. And that's still in place, weirdly. So theoretically, strand cetaceans are the property of the crown. And then what that means in practice is it's a responsibility to the landowner in terms of disposal. With a porpoise or a dolphin, it's fairly easy. With a 30-ton whale, it gets complicated. And I'll, I'll tell you a story around that if that helps put some light on it we were involved yeah. with the female stranding in cornwall uh, many years ago the long and short of it was it turned up on a la- uh, caravan site camp the owner there had just taken over a few months before never thought she'd have to deal with a dead whale on the beach and suddenly she had this 30 ton whale that was her responsibility to get rid of there's no insurance to cover that and i think as far as my way it ended up costing thirty thousand pounds to cover the cost of disposal so you know it's just an insight into what it means at the other end of the business you know people having to deal with the disposal as well as scientists like ourselves trying to learn more about why they happen. Is it generally the case that if an animal has got to the point where it's stranded, but it's still alive, there's usually something wrong with them in order for them to get to that point? So is it mostly not possible to return them to the water? Has that ever happened? You know, it does. There's a really good network of uh, live shining responders in the UK. We're all part of a coalition called the Marine Animal Rescue Coalition, which responds to live shining events. You know, if we get a thousand strandings a year, maybe five to 10% are live strandings. In terms of live shining response, it's all voluntary. There's no statutory response. There's no statutory support for this. It's all done on a shoestring by rescue groups. Ideally, they'd attend this live stranding event. They assess it with the the aid of vets. If it's deemed to be healthy enough, they'll try to refloat the animal. And that does happen. And if they're not, and if there's something wrong with the animal it appears to be compromised, then they will euthanize it and then it will come to us to try to learn more about what happened to it. So back to the wildlife pathology sort of feeding back into wildlife conservation. Can you virtually walk me through a case where the pathological investigation enabled you to understand more about the cause of death and then think about those wider impacts too? So maybe if we talk about the humpback that came into the Thames, I think at the back end of 2019, uh, nicknamed Hesse by the media. When Hesse was first sighted, she, she, as we found out later, was listing to one side and behaving morbidly. The whale was found dead uh, near Greenhithe two days later after first being sighted and then was removed by our colleagues at the Port of London Authority, taken to an off-site facility at Essex because we got a really good relationship with PLA. That allowed us to access the animal, carry out an examination. And, and the first thing that was immediately obvious was there was a huge wound on the underside of the head. What, what had looked like the mouth initially wasn't the mouth. There was a large gash running down uh, the mandibles on both sides. One of the mandibles, the jawbones, was fractured along its length. There were blood clots associated with those fractures that indicated they happened before death. There was wounds on the top of the head that we could see some photos when it was, when it was taken off. So that was all consistent with, with ship strike. So it had been hit by a vessel. Uh, alongside that, we also found evidence the animal was compromised. So it was, it was on the thin side. It had a parasite burden in the intestinal tract. And, and the other thing to point out is that the Southern North Sea is an abnormal habitat for humpbacks anyway. I guess in terms of the pathology investigation, the, the histopathology then confirmed that those injuries that we saw were pre-existing and they were uh, had a degree of chronicity, something around the order of 48 to 72 hours. And that tells us that then when the animal was seen alive, it had already been hit. And so that probably explained why it was listing to one side, why it's behaving morbidly. And so it's quite a sad extension to the animal's story, but it does tell us more about what happened to it. You know, it wasn't hit acutely, it had been hit survived and then died which which tells us more about the issue of ship strike ship strike is a global issue for affecting cetaceans all around the world and i think that helps us complete maybe the picture for hesse maybe the positive from this because it's a really depressing story is that humpback whales are recovering really well from the major pressure they had 30 40 years ago, years ago commercial whaling we banned commercial whaling in most parts of the world in 1984-86 we are seeing more around the uk and we are seeing uh, more humpbacks particularly maybe more in the northern 
more sea. So perhaps they're coming back to where they used to be historically, or they're just expanding their range to where they never used to be. There's been a story in the press a few years ago talking about how the Southern Ocean, Atlantic Ocean humpback whale population is now nearly back to its pre-whaling levels, which is fantastic news. The fact that we as a society chose to stop whaling means that these populations are recovering is brilliant. Unfortunately, and I always bring it back to bad news. You were, uh, you were doing so well with the good I know, news. <laughs> I know, I know. And then here we go, bad news again, sorry. It means there are going to be more events like this, sadly, because mm-hmm. there's more chance they're conflicting with our activities. So we may well see more entanglements, more ship strike cases. And that's why data like this is really important. Definitely. And what are the major achievements which you're particularly proud of coming out of the CSIP over the past 30 years? Are there any occasions where your research has fed back into real policy changes? Uh, Loads of examples. So our research fed into an EU-wide risk assessment for a a brominated flame retardant. So we have a huge data set on contaminants in cetaceans, probably one of the world's largest, thanks to our collaboration with CFAS. Um, And there's a particular flame retardant, which was of concern. There was this EU-wide risk assessment that our data partially fed into. There was then a ban on that flame retardant. It's used to stop sofas um, catching fire. Let's say you fall asleep and you've got a cigarette and in the 70s, your cigarette would fall, you'd go up in flames that be you over. That doesn't happen now because the flame retardants stop material that burning. So that's what they're used for, but they can cause toxic effects. And because of the assessment, that particular contaminant, that particular flame retardant was banned. And then we did a post-ban monitoring and we can see a real world decline post that ban, which is great. So you see there's a problem. We assess what the problem is. There's a policy change. We measure the effect of that policy change. And there's lots of examples like that in our network and others. But I think the thing that I'm really passionate about is public engagement and working with the public. I mean, our project gets a lot of profile, but then it gives you a chance to have conversations like this. Because I think it's really important for people to understand the diversity of life we have in our waters, which is fantastic, but also what that means in terms of what we're doing to them. It's incumbent upon us to try and protect that wildlife in our waters so that our kids will see it in future years as well. Inspirational. My final guest on this mind-blowing exploration into the world of pathology today is Dr. Tammy Shadbolt, a wildlife veterinarian and research associate also here in the Institute of Zoology. Thanks for joining us today, Tammy. So I have it in my notes that you've completed a degree in veterinary conservation medicine, then qualified as a vet, but that wasn't enough. You then got a master's in wild animal health and casually followed it up with a PhD on Tasmanian devil facial tumour disease and hold a PG cert in veterinary education. I mean, this is quite the collection of achievements and a huge dedication, clearly. Did you always know that this was the path you wanted to take or did each accomplishment sort of lead on to the next? That's a very good question. I think the answer is probably both yes and no. I grew up in the countryside and had lots of pets and a real passion for nature. And actually, my schoolwork experience as a teenager was with an environmental organisation. To be honest, I thought going to vet school might be beyond my reach academically. So it was a, a huge moment to then find that I did get into vet school. But I guess I never lost sight of my passion for conservation. And I had various opportunities along the way throughout my training and throughout my career to sort of bend my work back towards that. So I did my intercalated degree and my master's, my PhD, all in wildlife and um, then followed up with teaching and a teaching certificate. And really, I find myself in this very lucky position now that I have a role that um, synthesizes all the things that I have been able to do, the, the clinical work, the teaching and the research training. So, yeah, extraordinarily lucky to be here at ZSL. So what do you teach at the moment? So I actually am quite heavily involved with the master's teaching here in wild animal health and wild animal biology. So you started in the small animal clinical side of veterinary medicine originally and then sort of slowly moved towards wildlife conservation. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a fantastic first job in small animal practice and I really enjoyed those years. And I think every vet wants to spend that time in general practice, sort of cementing their clinical skills. So that was fantastic. And like I said, I I just took opportunities that came up along the way to not forget my passion for wildlife and conservation, but to eventually find a way to mesh the two together, I guess. And what team do you sit within now at ZSL? So I'm in a team called the Disease Risk Analysis and Health Surveillance Team, or DRAS for short. There's um, a number of us in that team, wildlife vets and wildlife biologists. And what's the aim of the DRAS project? 
Yeah, it's a really interesting project to be involved in, actually. Basically, we provide expertise to uh, groups that are undertaking conservation translocations around uh, the country. And I guess our work sort of falls into three main areas. The first is disease risk analysis or conducting DRAs, as we call them. And that's where we look at the risks, especially disease risks to animals during conservation translocations and advise on, on how the translocation should go ahead in order to mitigate against risk. The, the sort of second component is disease risk management, and that's where we're on hand to check the health of animals during an intervention and advise on biosecurity and things like that. And then post-release health surveillance is our final component. And that's where we remain on hand to advise after the animals have been released. So we might go back into the field and carry out health checks. And we also have submissions of, of carcasses from submitters that have found, unfortunately, animals that have died. And we will carry out post-mortem examinations and try and ascertain what the causes of death were and whether there are any threats to those populations. So that's where the pathology comes into your work. Exactly. And what main animals do you focus on in the post-release health surveillance side of DRAS? Well, we've got about 15 or so project species under us at any one time. So there's lots of different uh, taxa that we work with there. One good example is the, the pool frog. We go back into the field every year and carry out health checks on the pool frogs in the relatively small populations that exist in Britain. And in terms of post-mortem examinations, I would say that our most commonly submitted carcass would be the red kite. So although the red kites are doing really well in Britain now, since they were introduced a, a number of years ago, we do carry out post-mortems because we know there are threats to that population still existing. And not that you have any favourites, but what is your favourite animal that you've worked with? <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely. In the hazel dormouse. It's really difficult not to adore the species. Extremely cute and fluffy. But also I think because we're we're very involved with that project, we actually oversee a, a sort of eight 10 week quarantine period for the hazel dormice before they're released each year into the wild. And that means we're, we're checking their health every single day and um, interacting with them and uh, screening for disease. So this year actually was great. And we released the thousandth hazel dormouse into the wild alongside our collaborators. So it really marked an incredible effort by lots of organisations um, and individuals. That's amazing. So you must have programmes all over the UK and work with loads of different organisations and universities and institutions. Exactly. We collaborate with lots of NGOs. The JARS project is a, is a set up originally between uh, ZSL and Natural England. And then we work with academic institutes as well so that we can further our research and our techniques and things. So back to the main topic of this episode, we're really trying to dig into the wider impacts of pathological investigations. Can you talk about an example where pathology has impacted a species or a population in the wild in your work? I think I would probably highlight the red kites there because we've been involved for a number of years. So we can really start to see the impact of the post-release health surveillance that we do. And by working closely with the predatory bird monitoring scheme, we've developed a protocol for our postmortems where we take samples for toxicology testing. And we've been able to identify that second generation anticoagulant rodenticides do pose quite a threat to these beautiful birds of prey. So we think that a very high percentage of birds are exposed to these toxins during their lifetime. And for some birds, the levels that we see are sufficiently high to affect their health and to cause mortality. So just for, for anyone who might not know, what is an anticoagulant rodenticide? So that's your um, sort of rat poisons and things like that. And they're legal to use? They are. But I guess one of the benefits of our work and our research is that we hope to sort of work, and we do and we have worked with policymakers and, uh, and organisations to improve the way they're used. So through judicious use, we can minimise the risks to wildlife from them, acknowledging that they are legal and will still be used, of course, to some extent. 
would they just get into the red kite individuals through ingestion? And is it the thing where the, the higher the trophic level, the sort of more concentrated the, the pollutant? Yeah, you're exactly right. Because red kites are scavengers, so they will uh, scavenge on rodents that have died. And of course, if you scavenge on lots of <laughs> dead rodents that have, have died because they have ingested poison, then it will by accumulate in you as an individual. So yeah. What are the main threats facing red kites? Is it just this poisoning or are there other threats that they face? There's certainly other threats. We do unfortunately see birds that are deliberately persecuted. And by that, I mean uh, shot. We will detect that they've been shot using radiography and a post-mortem. And we do also see a number of birds suffering impact trauma. So often hit by a car or something like that. We also keep an eye on infectious diseases. We will take appropriate samples during a post-mortem and so red kites were endangered or their populations had had a huge dip at some point and now well it seems to me whenever I drive on the M4 they're everywhere but they're doing well in general now yes they are yes so there's no active translocations taking place now because the population is uh, self-sustaining which is great so does any of your pathology work ever get used in wildlife crime investigations uh, yes, it does, especially if we detect evidence of direct and intentional persecution. So like I said, the shot cases, or sometimes we will detect malicious poisoning, which is different from the, the second generation anticoagulant rodenticide issues that we see where there's been malicious and direct poisoning. So laced carcasses left out for birds. If we find that, then we will report to wildlife crimes teams outside of ZSL and they will follow up. Cool. That's really interesting. So the real applications of pathology are wide reaching. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Tammy. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Jenny. So one thing we're asking all speakers today is what's your one piece of advice for people who'd like to pursue a career in pathology or explore it further? I'd say if you want to be a pathologist, you have to be someone who's fascinated by disease and really every type of disease. You have to be really excited about the idea of finding something wrong. In many ways, although that's not all crime, it is all detective work. Each case is its own individual little puzzle that it's your job to solve. That's what gets me out of bed every day. It's what I love. I love uh, solving all these mysteries. And so if you're someone who's really motivated by that type of detective work, then pathology is absolutely for you. I guess from, from my background, I, I'm, I'm best suited to, to give advice to vets who might be interested in a career in, in wildlife pathology. Um, and I'd encourage them to start off with working clinical practice and then go on to do traditional training um, with an anatomic pathology resident with companion animals and livestock and then start expanding um, into zoo and wildlife if they have a particular interest and passion for working in that field. I should definitely point out I'm not a vet, so I'm a cetologist. Obviously, veterinary pathology is a very specialised field and my veterinary colleagues you know, have a huge amount of experience in that area. I'm fortunate enough that I can assist in these examinations, but I've approached them from a different angle. And I, I suppose if I was trying to give advice, if we perhaps expanded it slightly to the field of cetology, there are opportunities. There are a number of mailing lists you can join on to. There's one for Europe called ECS All. There's one for the global community called MARMAM. Uh, lots of volunteering opportunities come up. And I guess all I'd say is do that volunteering go to these conferences introduce yourself think if you get to meet these people that's how you get your foot in the door and like I say I know people who have pursued these internships these volunteering opportunities and now they have flourishing careers in marine mammal science and it's hugely exciting really rewarding um, it is difficult and it's very competitive but if you want it go for it why not good luck well, I'm sure listeners will appreciate that myself and my colleagues have come to our various roles from quite different routes. And I think that's really inspiring. For some of you, you might sort of know that you want to follow pathology as a direct route, but you may choose to go down the veterinary medicine route or, or conservation science route first. Just be really open to opportunity because there's definitely ways that you can sort of mould your career so that uh, you, you end up in a position that, that you are working with pathology in a in an arena that really interests you be it wildlife medicine or a different one 
Thank you to all our speakers who took part in today's episode. And of course, thank you to you, our listeners. If you enjoyed today's recording, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. You can find us on Twitter at ZSL Science and Facebook at ZSL Science and Conservation. As a charity, your support helps ZSL to care for the amazing animals in our zoos and protect wildlife around the world through our science and conservation work. If you're able to, you can donate on our website at www donate.zsl.org or join ZSL as a fellow to get closer to conservation and science. 